Greetings, everybody, and welcome once again to our journey through James Bond. I'm Tom Connors, and with us is Robert Meyer Burnett, our special guest. How are you doing? I'm I'm actually 0013. Good for you. I don't even know if there are 13 <laughs> people licensed to kill, but if there were, I'd be 0013. First to die, probably. Oh, well, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> we also have the boss man here who's only here for a short time, but uh, we're still glad to have him here. How are you doing, Andre? I'm good, thank you. So thanks for having me for for this uh, this uh, next Bond video, which, uh, which has been a long time coming. So it's great to get back on track with that. Absolutely. And also joining us, of course, is Rob, the voice of Midnight's Edge. How are you doing? Uh, how's it going? Uh, if you're 0013, that means I'm negative 0063. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's integers on the uh, on the 00 scale, though. So. Well, you just made, you, you know what? That just became canonical. There absolutely yes. well, must be. I'm double <laughs> overweight, so. <laughs> you can change that. Yeah, I know. That's what they tell me. I've been trying to do that. I've been I've been doing the doing some keto. I dropped uh, nine pounds in a week. Awesome. Oh, awesome! Good, nice. yeah. great, congratulations! Nice. Yeah, like that's uh, that's like the beauty with the traditional uh, martial arts. It may not make you a great fighter, but it's the best form of acrobatics that anyone can do. <laughs> Speaking of martial arts, this week we watched "You Only Live Twice." Um, sorry for the mess up. I forgot we already reviewed Thunderball. <laughs> or so it seems. One mm. for life for yourself, yourself and one, one for, for your, your dreams. dreams. And now, uh, this now is now you know why we'll need. never be Newton, Robert, and I will never be doing a actually. That was pretty team. good. You guys, uh, we just to coordinate, man. We didn't even rehearse. Yeah, that was pretty darn good for no rehearsal. Um. This, of course, would be one of the first Bond movies to get canceled, um, and that might be one of the reasons why it's my favorite one so far. No, I'm just Ooh, kidding. No, actually, I enjoyed nice. it quite a bit, uh, to be honest with it's, you. I'm, yeah, I mean, come on. It's I mean, It's got so many. It, it's oh, it's not my favorite Bond movie, but it's got just so many great elements in it. Oh, come on. Yes. I did Although, say so far, yeah. It also, it, I think it also is a turning point in the series where – where the credulity of the Bond saga, as we might call it, is strained. <laughs> well, what I noticed in this one is you got a lot more of the Bondisms, um, yeah. especially when you get to like Blofeld's, uh, you know, hideout and all that kind. Of, like all of that is like I, I felt like I was watching an Austin Powers movie for a minute or two. Oh yeah, yeah. That's where they take a lot of it from. Really, I mean, that's that's this. This is the film where they take a lot of the jabs thrown at the bond series in austin powers from really dr evil is dr. right e it dr evil came from donald pleasance's portrait yes of exactly. there's so Blofeld. much stuff out of this one you could tell and darian yeah. Mitchell, thank you so much for the super sticker we appreciate that the volcano layer <laughs> oh yeah i mean one of ken adams great sets in the bond saga uh so good and and roll doll who wrote yeah. the novels Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Char you know, James and the Giant Peach. I did notice that. Scripted this movie, you know, based yeah. on Fleming's novel. Yeah, so that's another Norwegian connection into the into Bond right there. So, And yeah. you can definitely tell, that, I don't know what the budget was on this one, but you could definitely tell compared to the first four, this one had a little bit bigger budget or at least uh, like a lot of the uh, opticals and stuff weren't nearly as uh, hokey as some of the last films. No, and there's a lot, lot more visual more effects. I mean, yeah, it goes. It starts in space. We're now we're in we're in orbit. The yeah, budget, Earth orbit. The budget was nine and a half million dollars. Wow, yeah. for that for what was it? Sixty seven. This one came out. Yeah. yeah. What the what the what would the equivalent of that be um, by modern standards? Uh, I think you multiply it by or times five. So, uh, 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 a lot. I mean, of course, it doesn't really compare in any event because it would like, probably be closer, close to a hundred million or eighty million. What, what we can say is that this was blockbuster cinema uh, in a in a time when um, when there wasn't really uh, any blockbuster cinema, uh, and we got a couple of uh, super chats that I want to address. It basically, right add like ten million per decade and <laughs> yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, Spider Unlimited says, "Hail! I never ask for anything or try to impose, but please, please get me any of your bonds. Uh, get me on any of your bond panels. I know 007 top to bottom, left to right, and would love to talk." 
Well, um, tell you what, you are one of our members. We're going to have a member stream coming up pretty soon. Yeah, we um, are. So we can talk about it there. We can there. And uh, yeah, that and then depending on uh, your mic quality and all that stuff, you never know what can happen from there. But yeah, well, we can definitely do an audition of sorts. How does yeah. that sound? And then we got, holy cow. 50, yeah, Swiss got 50, francs, 50 Swiss francs, that's uh, that's pretty sizable. Well, so thank you so much to Martino Sulmoni. A great man, by the way. 13, license to donate. <laughs> I just I just ran actually the number through the inflation calculator from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. $9 million, that's the same buying power as $72.2 million today. I was so, pretty close. Wow. And I back then, that's close. a monster budget. Oh yeah, eighty. Gold, Goldfinger was a three million dollar budget. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can you know, definitely the, tell that there's a jump in quality for sure. I mean, we don't really understand, but the Bond franchise in the '60s was monstrous. It was a huge, huge, huge franchise. It was it was wildly popular around the world. So yeah. So basically, the story of this, real quick. Let's uh, get that out of the way. Uh, the 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 USSR and the US are in a space race. And each think that the other is stealing their <laughs> rockets. And uh, we're on the brink of war. Mm -hmm. And only one man can help us, but he's dead. <gasps> well, that's what's so cool. The pre-title sequence, Bond gets killed, assassinated. So for everybody who's... complaints is they don't really explain how he got out of that one or set that up or what the whole deal was. Or is that like well, completely just a setup? No, well, that's a setup. They fake his death so that yeah. okay, that's what I thought. I, I figured it had to be, yeah. Go deep cover, really deep cover. So you know the attention. I've been of deep them. before, but now I'm going deep, 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 deep and, the cover. And <laughs> so, so uh, to everyone who always says, you don't even know where I'm at. You'd be like, actually, I won't even answer. But but to everyone who always says that their idea for a great Bond script. Oh yeah, if I was writing a Bond script, I would totally kill him off in the first five minutes. I'm like. Been there, done that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's a beauty. You can say, "Wow, we've done that, and we've done it better." Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. that's one thing. On yeah. that note, at though, least he died on the job. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. was great, uh, gentlemen. I will have to. I will regret that. I will have to take uh, take my uh, a brief leave of uh, leave of absence. Was to what I was looking okay. for. Uh, but uh, but everyone just uh, just stay here because there's a great stream coming up with some awesome. We might need talks. you to come back later to help catch up with super chats if we get too far ahead. So yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll yeah. let you know for sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, but uh, but as of right now, we are fully caught up. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, then uh, of course uh, the only one who can help us is Bond, and he is sent to Japan uh, undercover. Uh, <laughs> under, under deep cover, <laughs> deep, deep, deep on a cover. The super uh, cop story, it was working. It was working. <laughs> okay, <laughs> by the way, one of my favorite movies, okay. maybe of Definitely all time. Lie. <laughs> I would, I would, not for nothing, I would love to see Eddie, what Eddie Murphy would look like in a spy parody, though. That would be. Well, he oh. already did I spy, and it didn't. Well, work yeah. Out well, well. Did, I mean, I mean, a good one, Tom. I know, right? Uh, Sonny Crockett, well, wow, all the way from Miami Vice, says, "Hey, R and B, I pre-ordered the Doc Holiday Tombstone One Six figure and feel pretty moist about it." Is Hailed that the Red, Red Man Red, Toys, Red, Toys Red. version? I think it's Red, 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 Red Doc Red. Holiday toy. Yeah. Oh my! I have a Red Man toy behind me. I have Natalie Portman from The Professional. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. She comes. You with are opening an avenue to things that are, is a very bad thing for me, Robert. Mm. You know what I, I, I. You know what As and I always say. Uh, the answer to every question is why. Yes, you should. I mean, I already got a problem, as you can see back there. <laughs> they taught us an improv because no, you never say no. You say yes, accept, and then justify. Mm -hmm. So that's uh -huh. kind of a good, good mantra to live by. Accept, then justify. Now, but what's interesting, man, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say about like you only have twice. Um, Sean Connery got into a little bit of trouble because in the press, he was asked how he found, I don't know, the, I'll par I'm paraphrasing, but he, he, he didn't find Japanese girls uh, the most attractive. That's what he said. <laughs> and, and I remember reading that when I was a kid, I, I read every book about the Bond franchise and I, I love Japanese girls. <laughs> And I mean, how do you watch Godzilla versus Monster Zero and not want to be ensorcelled by one of those uh, aliens from Planet X who's really a hot Japanese girl wearing black and silver? 
Uh, mm-hmm. And she's an alien. I'm like, oh, that's the best thing in the world. But that actually happened, and there was they had a press issue. Um, can you imagine if that happened today? Oh my god! And of course, Sean Connery at one point is made up with with to look Japanese, not very convincingly, I might add, <laughs> in the film. Yeah. But he, um, oh, go ahead. I mean, it looks like Sarek. Yeah. To... Yeah. He, yes. He does. Honestly, but, um, I was expecting worse. Like, let's be real here. Like, it could have been a lot worse, yeah. more stereotypical. And they yeah. didn't, considering the time, it could have <laughs> come on. One, one of the things that strikes me, though, is you have, I mean, think about think about the era of this the, this was made in. The mid-1960s. Yeah. You, the height of the Cold War. But, I mean, how many, how many films, uh, besides the Godzilla movies, how many Western films showed Japan in the post-war 1960s. I can't think of a whole lot. No, n- not a whole lot. And I think that was one of, when I was a kid too, that was one of the, the things that attracted me the most. You you got to see industrial Japan. You got to see the countryside of Japan, the fact that they actually went to Japan. And and I was, as a kid, really interested in, in Japan. It, it started with Japanese science fiction movies like mm-hmm. kaiju films or movies like the, the Mysterians. And... Um, I, I, I love that for that reason. And I, I loved, like, I loved the Japanese, like, the linen suits that spies would wear. Like, the I loved all of that. You know, every everything about this movie that was Japanese, I just, I loved it all. And I wanted more of it. But it was just, I, I loved that aspect of it. And again, you know, one of the, I think, appeal of the Bond franchise was, and we talked about this before, is that, you know, in the in the '60s, not a lot of people were doing international travel, so the locations uh, where the Bond films went to were things that most people hadn't seen. Because after post World War II, there wasn't a lot of people that were traveling internationally, and so I think this was sort of always the Bond franchise was a window into these places that no one had ever been, which is one of the appeals of right. of, of the franchise as a whole. And um, I love that. And of course, this introduces Little Nelly. The gyrocopter that was sort of the version of the Aston Martin, the flying little Nelly that Bond had that you could have it in a suitcase or whatever and unfurl it. And now that you bring that up, there was one shot of the special effects that bothered me because I know they're miniatures. Yeah. But how hard is it just to have the camera pan just a little bit as the miniatures are explosion to make exploding to make it look like the miniatures are moving? <laughs> well, some of the worst shots. Ever. Yeah, the, the, I know that this this film has very, uh, I think, uneven at best visual effect shots. That's all they needed to do. I mean, I could do that digitally now. <laughs> yeah. Dark Shadow Logan Bond was also the Travel Channel of the sixties. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very good analogy. Yeah, it really, really is. is. I mean, they're learning as they're going. And Dash DC says, "I so loved Bond. He was." what every man wanted to be smart ladies, man that drove a cool car, smoke in a bar, tear off a guy's head and look good doing it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Rob. That, that actually talk about, talk about cool car, that, uh, that car, that, uh, the Toyota, that, the Toyota, Toyota 2000 GT. Oh man. Was, Sh- Sean Connery was too tall to fit it. That was originally a hard top. Yeah. And they said, okay, give us two weeks. The engineers took the car. They cut the roof off for him. By the way, I'm a huge Toyota fan. Like, I've always loved Toyotas. My first car that I owned was a Celica, a Celica GT back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted the Toyota from this movie. Like, I'm like, why don't they make one now? Make it a little bigger so I could fit in it. But I would totally give me a Supra. Give me a new Supra or or give me give me that. What is it? The 2000 GT. Man, yeah. I'd drive the shit you know, out of that car today. It's funny you mentioned that. You would think in this day and age with the way things are that the car companies would finally go, you know what? We need to do more like custom car, not custom cars, but like mo- like movie cars and like like oh, yeah. package these limited edition car. I-, I just don't understand. Like I go buy an Ectomobile. I go buy a DeLorean. <laughs> 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 I-, I mean, can you imagine having an Ecto? You know, yeah. uh, they do make a six scale Ectomobile for the... Yeah. Um, for the Blitzway Ghostbusters figures, I no, may or I may know, not be paying I, one off right right now. <laughs> but I'm I not mean, one real one. one. But yeah, no, like yeah, I just I can't believe that that market hasn't opened up yet. <clears throat> no, and I I you know they're making they they are manufacturing DeLoreans now again. And yeah, and you, I heard. Yeah, yeah, you can. But I agree with you. I mean, think about that. All the they made like a, a a I don't think it was exactly the same, but they made like a bullet version of the Mustang recently. Like I don't know in the last. 
I don't we know, can 10 have years a ago. Batmobile every 10 years. Can you imagine how many guys would be buying up Batmobiles? Yeah, there's a um, there's a game actually called GT Legends, which is all racing, uh, uh, like uh, touring car racing from the 60s. And actually, that was like one of the first mods I sought out to put into the game. It was a, it was a Toyota 2000 GT. And there's there was only 330 of them made, I think. I think one sold at auction about uh, about ten years ago for a million and a half dollars. I mean, so it's it's a rare gem if you could find one. Jeez, yeah, I, yeah, out of my budget. So, by the way, I I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this film was photographed. the The cinematographer was the great Freddie Young, who shot um, uh, Lawrence of Arabia and Doctor Zhivago and Ryan's daughter. Uh -huh. So he was an Academy Award winning. That cinematographer shows, yeah uh yeah and and i mean he was one of the great uh people and one of the first people to shoot in cinemascope so and obviously since thunderball the bond films moved to a widescreen format well at least they did thunderball you only live twice on her majesty's secret service and diamonds are forever were all cinemascope widescreen films and then they went back to i don't know if they were 166 or 185 but for live and let die and mouth golden gun they they didn't they were no longer widescreen and then they went back to widescreen with um spy love me and they never went back but so the, the television i bet yeah the widescreen photography in, in this movie is very very cool there's, yeah, a, and you can there's tell. this one shot when bond like they're on the roof of like that factory and it's a helicopter shot oh and yeah that bond's was... running across you know and the guys i love that shot i'm like yeah man that's dope it's great. The camera pans, the helicopter takes off, pans back, it shows all the guys chasing him. That's a great yeah. even, even when I was a kid, I saw that on like basic uh, no, it was not a basic cable, it was on like um, the movie channel or HBO, whatever it was. I was like, Yeah, that's a, like that's the one shot I always remember I, I wanted to see. Yeah, because you're like, yeah. that's that's real, man. <laughs> yeah, you could tell they that was on location. <laughs> they were out doing that for real. Rob, um, time to put out the trend. Not now, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you know, Ken Adam, the great Ken Adam, the production designer. I think that the volcano, Spectre's volcano base, where they're stealing the spaceships from orbit and bringing them back, has to be one of the great, one of the great sets of any movie ever made. Not just the Bond franchise, but any, I mean, that's just a huge set. And this was uh, uh, following up on the underwater battle in uh thunderball the the end ba battle like one of the things i loved as a kid was when you'd have two warring factions fighting at the end of a bond film and they did it in thunderball they kind of did it in goldfinger but you didn't have like troops but the end of this movie dudes rappelling down on ropes and ninjas <laughs> i mean the end of, the climax of this movie was everything that any yeah. especially a kid would want yeah, and and they would follow that up. I mean, the, the movie that follows this is Honor Majesty's Secret Service, that also has an incredible assault at the end on a, on a base, mm -hmm. uh, a Spectre base at the end of the movie, and you know that was kind of a thing that they that that was a, a Bond trope. They haven't used it so much anymore, but it was awesome when they did it in this movie. Yeah, that was one thing that was really cool was the ninjas. Uh, Mecca J says, Robert, you're serious? They're making new DeLoreans now? Well, I think they're just using the old parts, are they not? Isn't that the... No, they were like making... Maybe they were using old parts, but they well, I think were... Makes, man, yeah, but... They were manufacturing. I mean, I would... Who wouldn't want one? Well, you know, I know then, for course, years, they had like a warehouse full of the parts. You could order it piece by piece and put it together yourself if you wanted to. I know that. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, that was like a thing for years. So, yeah, I don't know what they all do, but I did hear that they're like doing like ramping up a uh, if they haven't already. So, that would be cool to have a DeLorean. Yeah, the um, uh, boy, like I said, the uh, the whole thing about and and the, and the other thing like I said the the over the top action. Well, they're brand new. They're even electric, I guess. We got to see ninjas in the nineteen sixties. Yeah. Well, this is yeah. probably I imagine the first time a lot of American people were even introduced to that kind of a thing because i can't imagine like a lot of people had seen many kurosawa films or anything like that in america at that point and you know i'm sure the ninja was kind of a new concept because you can even tell here they quite didn't get it right <laughs> but no but no. also you know they teamed up they had the help of um godzilla producers that at toho studios you know they gave them facilities to shoot at and they they provided them with with japanese stars the women to be in these films because you know i'm a huge fan of japanese films of the 60s i mean there's some really defining 
uh, just cool. Even Kurosawa when he did High and Low, uh, which is a gangster. Okay, because I thought I did recognize the chick that he's with at the end, his partner that he gets married to. Is she from one of the Toho films? I'm sure. She, I, I yes, but I'm not sure. Like yeah, because I was gonna say she looked very like I recognized her, but I couldn't remember where I see. And I'm like, okay, so that makes sense now. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it, I mean, it's just the, the plot of this movie to me. It, this is one of the movies that, as a kid, made me love the Bond franchise because it's really outlandish. I mean, it's really epic, and the fact that you see spaceships being stolen, which is a trope they reuse in Spy Who Love Me. Instead of spaceships, it's submarines, nuclear submarines that are being stolen from the sea. But it, it was like, how do you not? And, and uh, by the way, the score, the score, for, great this score movie, for this one, yeah, great score. No. I mean, even even people like uh, the Propeller Heads would, uh, when they were doing, they they did, recorded their album, I don't know, twenty one years, twenty two years ago. Um, they did a great piece of music where they um, adapted the Space March from this movie which is just a great piece of great piece of music that is actually a great that is actually a great piece of music yeah they use, yeah. yeah they use it on top gear one time when james may was flying an, an airship to prove oh. that um that uh airships were the wave of the future to relieve congestion but unfortunately they changed it for the uh for the american broadcast but you they, know i've wanted that's a I, i've always wanted to own one like how expensive could a goodyear blimp be like, can I make some dirigible and own it and have a private, like, just float around the world in it, with it? <laughs> well, well what I, you get, I mean, wouldn't it be cool to just take a leisurely stroll around the planet with your I'm airship? Not, I'm not sure if you need a, a pilot's license or, or whatever to, to fly one. I mean, yeah. certainly, there's no law against owning one, I, I guess. I, I, I mean, that would be, to me, where's the private airship yachts? <laughs> you know, I want one. I just want the critical drinker did a... um. Uh, a great piece on the Rocketeer, the movie The Rocketeer, and of course there's a there's a giant Nazi airship in that movie, and I'm like, I would love to fly. I've never been on one, yeah. but like the Hindenburg, some giant dirigible that you could have a like the most luxurious cabin ever, <laughs> just float around the world. Yeah, and I was just looking this up. So yeah, the one that I was, I think this is the one I was talking about, Mia Hama was originally in, in the original King Kong versus Godzilla. That's what I thought. I thought oh, I recognized yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And that's the one I've seen the most, so that's probably why. <laughs> yeah, and she plays Kissy Suzuki. Yeah. What a great name for a Bond girl, Kissy wow. Suzuki. Yeah. <laughs> she has a face of a pig. Yeah, I thought I thought that was I, I always thought that's bad. Like, cause yeah, she's cute. I'm like, oh come on. <laughs> no, the, the, well, that was a whole joke. Remember, Rob, yeah. is that they kept bringing up the ugly girls, and then all of a sudden she's there, and he's like, oh, she's not ugly. Yeah, you know, I know. I yeah. Like, yeah. But still, like, oh yeah, the, the, she was hot. Yeah. I mean, come on. I, I love, I love the Japanese title though. For I, for the you, you've, I don't. Is it the title for this film, Mister Kiss Kiss Bang Bang? Um, so no, that it, was I think Thunderball. That was Thunderball. Okay, that was for Thunderball. I okay, think so. And but that's a, it's so, but it's it's so descriptive of of James Bond, Mister Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Yeah, Six says she had a cat named Kissy. There you go. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I. Loved Kissy Suzuki. <laughs> yeah. and there was a, there was a uh, short story where Kissy Suzuki had a um, had a had a, a son with James Bond. It was a short story, and um, was it uh, Frau Bunt the... murdered him? Yeah, I was gonna say you yeah. brought that up in a video before. Yeah, I, I've done so many videos. I can't keep them all all straight properly categorized. I I need a Dewey Decimal System now for. For all the videos we've done, <laughs> jeez. But yeah, so I apologize for the many changes of the title and the thumbnail. <laughs> it was my fault. I didn't know. I forgot we had already reviewed Thunderball. You um, know, I gotta say, I just, I just, I just did a cursory Google search uh, on um, on uh, Mihama and it, what happened to her. And it, it's an art. This is an article from the Express in the UK. Uh, it says she was forty when she dropped out of filmmaking altogether after she said she had an epiphany while driving through rural Japan and encountered an old farming village that was being ripped down so a new dam could be built, she said Japan was giving up its real self in its rush for economic development. So good on you. Good on you for uh, probably getting involved in me, Hama, getting, make, sure, make sure Japan stuck to its roots. I like her even more now. There you go. She became an activist. I wonder if she's still alive. Uh, that's well, she apparently was still alive in uh, October uh, 2019. Yeah, that might be. 
Um, yeah, I love the, the you brought up the score earlier. This one stands out a little bit more above the other ones, especially because of the theme song, I think, and how it just it's different. Nancy I mean, Sinatra. Yeah, and I honestly I'm trying to remember, did we even get to hear the standard Bond theme in this movie? I know we got the yeah, dun, 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 yeah, dun, yeah, dun, yeah, it's dun, 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 yeah. Dun, dun, yeah, and also, I mean, this is also, I believe, it is um, the second Bond theme song sung by a Nancy woman Sinatra. after Shirley Bassey did Goldfinger, and uh, I, I think it stands up. You know, Frank Sinatra's daughter doing this. I, I really like. It's very romantic this theme song, and but I really like it. No, so far this hasn't been my favorite Bond film. Again, I mean, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. But of the five we've seen, this is so far my favorite. I think I'd describe it as, as it's a very lavish musical score that under yeah. for the, un, the, the all the under that that under that surrounds this film. It it is, you know, it's a very, you know, it's very deep. It's very colorful. It's very detailed. It's very well, it's a very sixties score, and that's yes. one thing is, I mean, uh, you know, Rob and I, Robert and I really love soundtracks and, and score soundtracks. And that's the thing is you can tell generally by just listening to a little bit of a score, what decade that movie probably, or that score was written. Yeah. In. And that's the thing with these bond scores is, I mean, especially in this one, like it just, I felt, I felt the sixties in it. Cause I, I don't know if you guys recall when I said we were talking about the earlier bond films, like the first one specifically, I'm like, this doesn't even feel like the sixties. If I remember right, I think even said I, it felt more like the late fifties. Um, and then it wasn't until we got the last couple where I'm like, okay, now we're getting there, you know. And this one specifically, I'm like, I'm the, this was Bond through and through from beginning to end. I mean, it just it was it felt like everything yeah. I expected out of a Bond movie. It's big, it's grandiose, exactly. It's yeah. And you know, they did a really they did a really great job. W what I really liked about Bond scores too was they would take the theme song and then incorporate that that theme the, the the music into various yes. iterations they would turn it into a romantic version of the theme or they would this film has great big brassy action set pieces scored to versions of the main theme song so there's this there's a motif running through a musical yes. motif and a lot of it i feel like lately that has sort of been dispensed with uh, a lot of the time uh, well, lately well, because it's because partly I think it's because that nobody really knows how to write a Bond song, Bond theme. And they just write, oh, yeah, I'm going to put my own personal stamp on. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't want to say it. it's going to be this is a, this is something apart. And the best example I always point to it of somebody really writing. And I'm biased because I'm a, I'm a huge fan is Paul McCartney when he wrote Live and Let Die. And you hear it every Everywhere you hear it everywhere throughout the entire film, you know, you hear it in the action sequence, you hear it in the like the revelatory sequences, you hear it at the beginning, the end, you know, <laughs> you know, you hear like he gets the thing, you know, do do Well, uh, and I mean, that came from uh George Martin, who I was gonna say, Beatles, I was gonna say, was that more George Martin or was that Paul yeah. McCartney? Yeah, no, was, well, George, George Martin, who produced the Beatles records, wrote that score. And so he, you know, they probably worked in, in close. The, it's always best when the composer of the Bond films is working in close collaboration, writing the well, theme that, song. That, so then it all, it all, it all becomes, a, yeah. Da -da. It's pure Bond. Like, I mean, like, Rob, I get what you're saying, Rob. Sorry, yeah. Rob. And no, that, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Rob, go ahead. No, I was going to, no, you go, you go ahead. It's, it's just great. I love yeah. that. And that was part of the, fran it's part of the franchise. And the, and to this day, whenever I've seen Sir Paul live, and I've seen him like tw over twenty times. The 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 one number that always brings the house down is "Live and Let Die." Yeah, always, always pyrotechnics, fireworks, lasers. It could be in an arena. It could be in a stadium with seventy thousand people. Always, always, that is the big number every single night he plays. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I I, I think that that's you know one of the enduring qualities of the bond franchise is these larger than life grandiose sequences and even like the aerial sequences i love that in in, in it seems like in movies of the 60s they all use the same helicopters you know the one i don't know that i don't actually know the number they're not they're not um they're not know. hueys but they're those the big bubble front with sort of the lattice work uh yeah. rear 
rudders kind of thing and the and, mash helicopters i call yeah, them, yeah. The, absolutely the mash helicopters but the but the more beefier versions of those and i love that like the little nelly the aerial chase sequence and this and all that there's some great it's just great great stuff in the in this film yeah yeah those no, are I, those are the those are the bell h13 sue there you go okay yeah they're in there every yeah in the six fit in the sixties they're everywhere, everywhere everywhere you know they're sort of ubiquitous and they use them in um uh they use them in Japanese films you know you see Godzilla swatting them out of the sky and they're used in all m- movies that are made in Europe they're like all over the world they must have been the most used or maybe they were just used in movies but the most used helicopters ever <laughs> I just love them uh, Platonic <laughs> Guardian says uh, this movie has the best title name drop ever um eh, i don't know of all time but well you only live twice mr bond yes this is my second life yeah yeah that i mean it's life. better than i must have scared the living daylights out of her it's better than that oh, yeah. <laughs> hyper guyver too thank you so much says in my opinion timothy dalton was the best bond and license to kill is the best bond movie but mm. you only live twice is in my top five bond films rip sean connery uh yeah and you also have to remember i'm seeing them in order for the first time uh so <laughs> it's kind of a good thing they're getting better as we go but i'm kind yeah. of preparing myself for some of the <laughs> <laughs> you need to prepare yourself you got you got one more that you're gonna love and then the one after that that's, yeah that's a little rough and i you know what it's i think it's a generational thing with license to kill well, uh, Timothy oh, Dalton. Lovely. Timothy Dalton. I did like. I think he gets a bad rap. Oh, I was, love. Was, I love the Living Daylights. I yeah. love Timothy Dalton. I hated License to Kill. Yeah, License to Kill is, is pretty is is lame. I, 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 only because I thought that the plot of it is so pedestrian. I mean, if you've been watching Miami Vice when it was on, and I was, uh, it, it seemed like so many other. Oh, there's a there's an evil drug lord. And we're oh going to go take him down. It was like the plot of every canon movie, practically, you know. And it was just, and they made it in Mexico. Not that making it in Mexico is bad. They just didn't spend a lot of money on it. And um, after Living Daylights, which was so epic and globe trotting, I just felt that you know, live and let die. I mean, uh, License to Kill was just a bit of a right. letdown. Although think- Dalton's really good in it, he's ruthless and awesome, and the the. Uh, Carrie Lowell and Talisa Soto are very good Bond girls. Mm. I think they kind of they they probably knew that hey you know this guy's not going to be in anymore anymore. We might as, you know let's let's hold out on <laughs> on making a real on spending a lot of money with this one. So yeah, yeah. although he was going to come back for a third one, but they have their legal troubles for six years. The Bond franchise went into for, there was you know they were making a Bond movie pretty much every two years since sixty two. And then 80, 89 was the last time there was a Bond film until 95's Goldeneye because Man. they had their fucking legal, multiple legal problems, which sucks. But for me, I remember when I remember when Letterman brought Pierce Brosnan out and he'll be starring in the new 007 film Goldeneye. Please welcome Pierce Brosnan. They had a, 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 a huge line of very elegantly dressed women and he was going down the line taking martinis off of the off the trays they were holding and drinking them down oh, it was probably <laughs> water but it was just but it was just a great moment that they that they had yeah yeah I'm like what a what a way to make an entrance really totally and that's kind of what i remember like i remember everybody wanting him as bond but six yes this is the first time i've seen these and how have i not seen these before well, um, as we explained in earlier videos, so I might as well do it here too because it's a good idea. Uh, growing up, it just it was not uh, a franchise that uh, I got interested in. My my dad was more into stuff that was like, you know, like war and western type movies, um, and Bond was just never one of the things he was into. Uh, so I was raised on like Rambo and Clint Eastwood and stuff like that, um, Schwarzenegger movies. But uh, no, I, I figured it's about a good time I see him. And with the new film coming out and <laughs> knowing so much about it already, I figure to heck with it. And I'm, I'm surrounded by Bond fans. And uh, yeah, so it was a good reason to do it. Um, hey, how's it going? Uh, Real Review 3000. Uh, Chris Knight, how you been? Says, are you including Never Say Never? Yes. Um, but funnily enough, <laughs> the plan was to start doing two movies a week this week. Um, or at least every time we get a chance to do these because so we had to get them all in before the new film. But... I mucked up. I forgot we already did Thunderball, 
So uh, we'll just do it in chronological order. But starting next time, we'll probably do two movies at a time, just so we can try and get through these a little quicker. See, I yeah, you know, I got mixed feelings about that. You know, because I think that when you're talking about the Bond movies, that uh, the official Bond canon is one thing. I mean, Never Say Never Again is a, it's an anomaly, and uh, it's just a remake, or uh, it is a remake of Thunderball. Maybe Ball. I'll watch mm -hmm. the Casino Royale with that one, the the other version, and we'll do like a special one on that yeah, one. I, th I think that's what we should do, is a special show, because uh, because you can't... You can't consider never because remember in 1983 when Never Say Never Again came out, Octopussy came out as well. So you you did have an official Bond right. film, and and I, I I mean Never Say Never Again is is there's well I I don't want to say what I think about it, but there's there's both good the very good and the very bad in that movie. So, so that's probably how we'll tackle that one. I'm thinking that's probably the, the best way to do that. Um, so yeah, gotta love Max von Sydow playing. So I see. I, I think it was Captain Robert April asked asked about Casino Royale earlier. I'll try and track that down, and then yeah, that's maybe what we'll do for that episode. We'll watch. Well, what you should really do is go back and look at the very first. There's been three Casino Royale. Okay, I'll try and find all of them if I can. And the first one was on American television, and oh, and mm -hmm. Peter Lorre plays Le Chief and and um, Barry Nelson who was later in The Shining, plays Jimmy Bond, an American CIA agent. And it was done for American television. And yeah. it is on Blu-ray. You can get it on Blu-ray. I mean, I know more about the other one. Like, I know, like, uh, Peter Sellers really, really wanted to be in it and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Like, I know all that stuff about the one, but that's, I've never seen it. And just, yeah, I know oh, it's, it's kind of a gotta, spoof or whatever, but yeah. You gotta see it. <laughs> yeah, so I think we'll do that for that a special episode, and we'll do it that way. But yeah, from here on out, we'll probably watch two at a time because i got one more connery one but there's the one in between because honor emergency service is the next one right yep and that's got uh because that's not with uh sean connery is it because isn't he he's like what what on emergency service i'm trying to remember which order they're in here because george lazenby's next mm -hmm. and then yeah i was gonna say because then but then he comes back right yeah and diamonds yeah. are forever yep okay. 71 yep yeah i'm trying to keep track of them all <laughs> And what's interesting is you get you get Blofelds in every movie, but they're all different. Yes. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Okay, yeah. So we got uh, Honor Majesty, Secret Service, and Diamonds Are Forever would be the next yeah. two. And they'd bring Donald Pleasance back <laughs> as and they when he's Tipo Henderson, they'd be bring back as Blofeld in Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, really, was it was there a shortage of guys in the uh, in the BAFTA who could play him, or what was going on there? <laughs> Although I did like Charles Gray making mud pies, 007. I love how they would randomly recast people back in the day in movies like that, just like out of nowhere. You know, it was just well, kind of weird. There's not a lot of people always weird. trying to make continuity out of these movies. As yeah. a matter of fact, oh, no. it's a Although somebody did a great youtube video about putting these movies in order like a and you have to you have to just forget that there's different actors in the films but in terms of its continuity beginning with casino royale as the first bond film and it was interesting because it makes when you watch the video it makes a surprising amount of sense if you forget traditional continuity and go through the bond franchise and watch watch it all as a as a piece it's pretty neat it's pretty nifty so I don't know who did that video, but it was um, it was interesting. Suspension of disbelief, it you know, yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, I've never seen a movie more uh, that asks the viewer more to suspend their disbelief than actually this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's quite a, quite a bit. So Tom, where were we? Well, a Spider Unlimited wants to know who uh, Robert's favorite Blofeld was. Oh, Telly Savalas. In honor, Majesty's Secret. Who Service. loves you, baby? Yeah, wow. I mean, it, but he's he's I I just because it's it was unexpected, and um, look, I, I wish I was really hoping that Christoph mm. Waltz was going to be my favorite Blofeld. Mm. Was Crop. not. Crops, entire lines, entire strains gone. So does I see? I haven't seen Christoph in too many films outside of Tarantino films, and people keep telling me when he's not with Tarantino, he sucks. I don't think he sucks. I think that he needs to be directed more. I think people, now that he's won two Academy Awards, they just, I mean, he was good. And I thought he was pretty good in Big Eyes, the Tim Burton movie, Big Eyes. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, I, I hated him as Blofeld. I was like, come on, dude. I mean, that I, I hated Spectre. I, mm-hmm. I, I can't believe that 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 movie where Bond can take out an entire base with this Walter PPK or something, you know, oh, one no. or, or shoot a helicopter out of the sky. Like, like what? You can't you're not going to fly the helicopter a little higher. It's like, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> yeah, um, that's Spectre, not my favorite. No, Dash no. DC sends in Canadian twenty dollars. Thank you so much. Says run your schedule by me first, please. I take my meds when I see Tom's security shirt. <laughs> if you keep adding episodes to the week, I'll overdose and I start liking Ryan Johnson movies and wanting to go on women's marches. Um, but yeah, well, this is supposed to be a, a normal thing. But uh, Robert got busy uh, with a lot of stuff going on uh, behind the scenes in his own, you know, daily work and life and. Uh, working on a show and other things and stuff like that. So um, now we're back in the in the mix of this. But when Robert's not available, we've decided what we're going to do is on the Thursdays that Robert's just happens to be unavailable instead of doing a Bond film or when we're done with the Bond films, uh, we're going to watch movies that Andre and I and Rob have never seen before but are considered classics. Um, and we've already kind of got started. Like I watched uh, Bridge Over the Ridge, River Kwai. Mm. Um, Rob, That's a great movie. Yeah, Rob watched uh, Shin Godzilla. Um, we're trying to get Andre to watch like, you know, last starfighter, things like that. So that's going to be kind of what we're going to do after this or in between this. If mm-hmm. it just so happens that we can't get Robert one week or when we get through with these, that's the plan. So there you go. Mm. I also watched uh, rewatched a bridge too far recently. Oh. So it's our own discovery uh, series. I think that's what Andre wants to call it. Discovering whatever, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. if we can, Sean Connery is great in that as Roy Urquhart. I mean, that's, yeah. We've been, they said we'd come out to two days. We've been here nine. You know, so that was, uh, we got Stubble McShave in the chat. Thank you so much. Says, uh, and they replaced the aging Sean Connery with a young talent, Roger Moore, who was three years older than Sean Connery. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Okay. Sometimes age doesn't. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you, us Irishmen and Scots, we don't age very well. Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk <laughs> says, uh, doesn't send it say, say anything, just sends it a super sticker. But thank you so mm-hmm. much. Appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. it. I'm starting to feel the bondisms in the in the films a little bit more. They're not. A, th- this one was paced a little bit better than the last few. I mean, I remember enjoying Thunderball and Goldfinger quite a bit, but uh, I mean, the, they were a little bit harder to get through than this one, I guess. Um, because I mean, I went, I started watching Thunder. Full disclosure, I started watching Thunderball again, and it took me almost twenty minutes before I realized, wait a minute, I've seen this movie before. <laughs> well, the, it's interesting that the series editor Peter Hunt, who ended up directing the next movie on her, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, you'll notice the editing in uh, Secret Service changes substantially. There's a lot of really interesting use of jump cuts, and so he was sort of being let off let off, off the reservation when it came to the kind of the kind of uh, uh, pacing that these movies were allowed and the pacing on this movie is definitely the editorial style is definitely the pace is picked up, but right. it goes, it's even like, just watch the fight scenes and there's a lot of jump cuts used to make the punches land in, in the next one in honor Majesty's secret service. Yeah. I'll be interested to compare it with that and sexy butt crack. <laughs> <laughs> Says it a super sexy. Thanks, you. Thanks so much. That, the name of the day right there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And Moonraker is going to blow my mind. I'm preparing for that one. Oh my god! <laughs> Moonraker rules. I'm preparing for that one. Again, Don't let anyone not, tell you anything. Else. Again, not a great movie, but it just has something. There's just something about it that you just can't stop watching. Oh, it's it's wildly entertaining, and and Moonraker is basically a remake of this. Yeah, it's remaking Spy Love Me, which was remaking You Only Live Twice. I was kind of getting that like a space vibe at first. I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't the space one. <laughs> <laughs> like, like uh, am I watching the wrong one? I'm like, oh no, okay, all right. You know, well, that's why I say I felt bad. Like, like seriously, I didn't realize I'd seen Thunderball. I'm like, I kind of did, but I'm like, it wasn't until that scene where he's on that one machine, and I'm like, wait a minute, I've seen this before. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, shit. You know, so I kind of felt bad about that. But again, I, I mean, I've only seen these each once through so far, and. uh yeah, I, I I really should probably watch them twice, but finding the time to watch a movie twice is the only way to live, Tom. It is, it is indeed. Martino Salamani says uh, it's implied that Blofeld was getting plastic surgery between movies. It's discussed in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, The Lobes, and at the beginning of that, uh, Times are Forever. Times are Forever. Uh, you can see that Spectre is Spectre. It's a good 
experimental surgery. Experimental yeah, experimental I mean, surgery. I think he's trying to say that's yeah. kind of how they explain it. I mean, Charles, sure, Charles Gray could have been Donald Pleasance. Why not? Well, was yeah. just and who Pleasance was who was Telly else? <laughs> yeah, let's... was Donald Pleasance just shooting something else at the time, or or why was or okay? That's my big question. Then going into next next week, then or next time we get to talk. Uh, so what was the deal with uh, why why wasn't Sean Connery in the next one? Uh, what, what uh, he happened? wanted uh, he wanted to retire. Ah. Uh-huh. He did. I just think he didn't want to do the role. Anymore. And then they just threw a bunch of money at him to do uh, Diamonds Are Forever or what? Yeah, I think, but he like accepted the money for charity or something. He did something. Really? And, and, hmm. and I mean, he he is clearly, I, I don't want to diss on Sean Connery because I love Sean Connery, but but in Diamonds Are Forever, it's not like he looks like a spring chicken anymore. He he He's a little bloated. He's a little older, you know. Well, like I and, said, I'm sorry, Irish and Scots. We don't age well. Sorry. <laughs> not all um, of us are colin farrell and fucking uh liam neeson all right <laughs> come on man it's all about clean living right uh, uh liam neeson wanna... clean living he pisses on himself there's no way he cl- <laughs> <laughs> he's drunk every day probably some men are just lucky that's all it is <laughs> and i don't even drink <laughs> But uh, no, I, I I do think this movie is wildly entertaining as well. It is. It was. I was entertained by it. It was sucked as I got tired last night, so I had to finish it this morning. But even coming back to it, it just you know it was still kept me entertained for sure. Oh yeah. Best Bond girl name dash dash D two dollars two Canadian dollars. Pussy Galore is a great one. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, pretty on the nose. Come on, yeah. <laughs> I mean, come Pussy on. Galore is, yeah, and yeah. and 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 see, just seeing Honor Blackman say it, you know, yeah, and just, I must be dreaming. Yeah, that that's I mean, come on. you don't get much better than that. I like Doctor Goodhead though in Moonraker. There you go. We got over six hundred people Holly watching Goodhead. though, so please hit that like button. And if you haven't checked out the Burnett work yet, do yourself a huge favor and do that. Uh, Rob Atlas says the prisoners, Patrick McGowan was asked to play bond, but yep. he turned it down twice. That is correct. I would imagine you would be somebody who would know that. Of course, Robert. Uh, but yeah, that's an interesting bit of trivia. Thank you for that, Rob. I just, I started watching the prisoner. Actually, I only, a got, a couple, today. only got a couple episodes in, but I did start watching the prisoner and I do like it. I got to find time to watch the rest of the series, but it's, Oh you, yeah. Between yeah, yeah. all this porn watching, what? No, we weren't going to talk about that, Tom. The no, the prisoner. <laughs> I'm. It's one of my favorite shows of all time, and uh, obviously, as and I did 18 streams about it. We broke down every episode. If I can shamelessly plug that, but um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. You guys are between you and Doomcock and stuff are probably the reason that 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 show has even come back into somewhat like purview of the <laughs> people. You know what uh, I mean? Well, you know, it's funny that to me there there was something going on in in the '60s. I mean, it was the beginning of the paranoid political thriller. Uh, uh, like, if you look at some of my favorite movies from the '60s, John Frankenheimer made, and two of the two of the or three of the best are um, the Manchurian Candidate, Seconds, which is one of my favorite science fiction movies ever made, and Seven Days in May, which is about a military coup of the United States government, and these were awesome um the idea that that suddenly that that the government or our spy organizations were were nefarious they weren't things were not good and it was it was outside of of the cold war it wasn't necessarily well the manchurian candidate was all the communist nations teaming up but the um there was something going on and by the time you get to the prisoner that idea that they took the idea of, a, of an intelligence operative who is on the side of right and good and he is kidnapped and put somewhere um and he has to stand up for his individuality was definitely something that was being led up to by movies of the time we were losing throughout the 60s in vietnam and all that i think the west the brit the brits the americans the commonwealth nations we were beginning to lose faith in our institutions after the assassin assassination of kennedy and Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, there was something going on politically and and the, the very fabric of what we used to believe. We believed in law and order and the fact that America was was inherently good until the 60s. And then everybody was suspect. And the military industrial complex was creeping in as being the great villain of our time. And the prisoner was definitely a part of that. 
And and the thing about the Bond franchise is it remains sort of inherently good. Like the James Bond franchise did not have that. Like Bond was always going to save the world. There was, it was not too no, no problem was too surmountable or was insurmountable for Bond. He was always going to succeed. He was always keeping the British end up for England, and it never really got cynical. And, and I think that's part of what Daniel Craig's Bond movies have done, which is why maybe I don't like them as much, is because they are cynical. And and um, I don't know where I was going with this, but <laughs> it's, I, I was trying to draw some connection with the, the prisoner and Bond, and I don't think I did a very good job. So there you go. It's all good. We got the gay rascal, though, with five euros and 49. Uh, I don't know what the, the leftover would be. Uh, <laughs> side note, plumber's crack is ger in German is... Oh God, we really need Andre here now. Baru, Baru, or Dieter, <laughs> or Dieter, yeah. Uh, Baru Beter uh, I'm sure I butchered the shit out of that. Construction workers' cleavage is what it obviously. <laughs> That's a fantastic term. I, I gotta, I gotta get Dieter on that right now. No kidding, right? <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> that's good. That was really good. And then another one from Martino. Thank you so much. Sardaz was part of the deal. They had to pay for a couple of movies he wanted to do. There you go. Um, and I think people were also bringing up in the chat that this was the movie he actually donated to charity from, I believe. So yeah, there you go. Oh. Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk uh, says, uh, be careful rewatching older movies you've enjoyed. Unfortunately, I rewatched Lady Hawk and those rose tinted glasses disintegrated and then combusted. You'll have that from time to time. Oh, come on okay. now. When she I, says Navarre at the end when they see each other, come uh, on. Come on, dude. Okay, I will have to say I say this. This is my latest hot toy has arrived. I this is better than the JJ Abrams mystery box. I will be unveiling this soon. But it's not. It has me a little worried because it's not packed very well. <laughs> it's just, just so, just so there will be an, an unveiling shortly. I will say that a little, little teaser, little teaser here for the stream. So I will let you all just run imaginations, <laughs> run wild as to what it could be. <laughs> Rob, am I going to have to call you JJ with your mystery box? Yeah, but unlike JJ's mystery box, the, what I get is actually worthwhile. <laughs> so says you. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. All right, we had a couple more super chats here. We got Roger H. who says the prisoner is timeless and is especially relevant today. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen it yet myself, and Rob's watching it, um, so I'm sure I'll start checking it out. Um, but yeah, between you and Doomcock, Robert... <laughs> I've heard enough about it already. Yeah, well, get on that now. Come on. I know there just isn't enough hours in the day. If there could just be twenty-seven hours in the day or something, or oh, I'm with you. I, day, I don't like sleeping. I feel like I know, you know, right? There's so much stuff I want to see. I mean, I'll be dead soon as it is, and I, I'm like, man, if I didn't have to sleep, there would be so much more time to see many more things. But no shit, read many more things. Ray Young 74 uh, says best Bond girl named Dr. Christmas Jones purely for the payoff gag from Bond. <laughs> I thought Christmas only came once a year. Oh, yeah, Christmas well, came twice you'll, this year. You'll have that. Uh, I love the Bond girl names. They are they are very inventive at sometimes, and sometimes they're just like, it's like you're not even trying to hide it. It's just there, you know? Uh, Action Con says pre-Watergate spy movies versus post-Watergate spy movies. What's the difference? Oh, an interesting question, Robert. Uh, good question for you. Well, I mean, I think that you, you, the obvious answer would be to say that post Watergate uh, movies. I mean, the, the cynicism, the cynicism was already building, you know, against against our leaders. And uh, when when Eisenhower left office, he gave that great speech where he warned against the rise of the military industrial complex, um, being able to influence our politics, our government. Um, maybe even persuade the president to do things. And I think when our president actually, when the, when a U.S. president in Nixon actually participated in a crime in the Watergate break-in, our, our loss of innocence was complete. 
I mean, it maybe it began with with the rise of the military industrial complex. It certainly took a huge hit with the assassination of Kennedy. But by the time you actually have an American president resigning because he committed a crime, uh, America was no longer the America that it used to be. Maybe it never was. But I think that that there was just it was par for the course that our leaders are screwing us yeah. after after so post Watergate movies. There was still, you know, there was still a um there was still after after Watergate, there was no more, it's all shades of gray. There was never anybody, anybody who was a Dudley Do right and Bond, Bond always stood for that. That's why I really think that post Watergate, the Bond franchise leaned into fantasy. You know, it was megalomaniacs like Carl uh, Carl Stromberg in Spy Who Loved Me and then Hugo Drax in Moonraker. And then we get back to sort of a Cold War thing in, in For Your Eyes Only, but it was still, Bond is very much on the side of good. The megalomaniacs moved away completely from politics. And you 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 have you have these madmen who want to destroy the world and, and make this utopian civilization with Aryan people, beautiful boys and girls that are going to procreate and build a an eden-like human race in the wake of nuclear armageddon or poisoning the entire world's population with orchids <laughs> that's really what the <laughs> that's the plot of moonraker so i mean i think that's what was interesting about the boss oh, so that's where pickard got it <laughs> uh so yes there you go um but that's what i think the difference is is that post post watergate everything is cynical you know we're all no longer is there any great good in the world we're all just right the governments are screwing everybody and the the regular person's fucked and uh, i should not have said that did i just nah, i don't care um, I, no i was kind of kind of trying to keep it pg earlier but i think i said enough well i didn't point. say that and i guess i did say it in a section you know with all the pussy galore shit how are we gonna keep it pg yeah really and I never even said it from the start. She's well. She no. Tom. She has a very extensive uh, family of cats. I mean, she is no cat lady. Trust me. I've I've seen cat ladies. <laughs> well, it's uh, very progressive because in the book she's a straight up lesbian. Yeah. So pussy galore is actually it's it's the first instance of how progressive the Bond franchise. Well, and doesn't the Bond franchise also have like one of the first transgender people in it too? As far as that goes, an an actress. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, Tula. Right. Tula. Yeah. Script in, doctor in, for your eyes only, and the first openly gay, uh, gay assassins. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, if God um, had wanted them to fly, he would have given us wings, Mr. Kid. <laughs> uh, script doctor is doing his job, he's script doctoring your explanation. He says the analogy was to compare corruption of authority. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He script that's exactly in right live, in live time. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for see. That's why I need script doctor in my life. That is what you call a good note. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's, why that's I love exactly that, what I was trying to say. Uh, and then Colin Ewan says, uh, "Have no fear, Bond is here." Uh, yes, he is, uh, and we've got a long ways to go. Uh, Diamonds are forever is one of the movies that are on the roster next um so stay tuned for that uh we will be doing i believe two bond movies next time i hope that's the case um wow that'll be an interesting double feature yeah because we got to get Secret through Spurs and Di actually diamonds are forever is kind of a direct sequel to honor majesty secret Service. there you go so that works out right at least the pre-title sequence well i just is. figured to, for us to be able to get to them by november especially if we have to take a week or two off in between here and there we got to do two at a time and we're just never going to get there uh silver nova says uh my favorite line from a bond movie is in moonraker when bond and dr goodhead cut communications from m and m says what's bond going to do q replies i think he's attempting re-entry sir it's a great ending <laughs> spoilers <laughs> you guys gotta remember i haven't seen these yet <laughs> yeah no, I know you'll most forget of the and stuff. Yeah, I mean that's I, I forgot I even seen Thunderball till twenty minutes in. So sue me, uh, but yeah, I, I'll get there. Of course, it doesn't help that we hadn't watched it in a month. Uh, but uh, no, so next time you uh, hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, that is the plan. Uh, Robert, anything to say before we get out of here about Bond or uh, you only live twice or anything else? Uh, no, other than the fact that, uh, you know, You Only Live Twice has some of the great movie posters of all time. It you does know, have you, some good ones. You go and you look at the key art, Robert McGinnis, the great Robert McGinnis painted that artwork and 
boy, I really wish we live in a world where between Bond in uh, the bath with bathing Japanese beauties and then also like too here. that's a good poster but that wasn't one of the main key arts that's like an amalgamation of stuff the main the yeah. the the main key art of bond upside down inside the volcano base that's a piece of key art man come on the the one sheet the standard well that's one know. thing that uh, yeah the bond has never um failed in the poster department from everything i've seen we always get plenty of stuff to choose from for our thumbnails that's for sure until until of course they the last great a uh, painted Bond poster was uh, um, uh, View to a Kill. And then mm -hmm. uh, then it went strictly... There, there was different artwork across the world, but the main one sheets we got here in America it's went it, it went uh, to photo... photo picture, Sorry, when you said that. Dance into the yeah. Fire. That no, you said there. View to a Kill, so that's all that start, jumped in my head, of course, was the song. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, although the for your eyes only American poster, they that photograph was amazing. Script Did document. I miss your super chat, Aries? They jumped on me, and, and Andre's not here. Um, let me because I can't get back to it right now. Um, if you want to just uh, rewrite what you wrote, I'll, I'll definitely address it for sure. Um, I don't want to miss any super chats. Uh, but I thought I may have gotten all of them, but if I did miss any, I apologize. And do let me know for sure, because I can probably get Andre to come back in and make sure we got them all. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry, you guys were saying. No, the script doctor asked, did, uh, did we miss uh, talking about Bond's disguise? No, we discussed it. <laughs> I said it. I was surprised it wasn't worse. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. Yeah, honestly, I, I give it a pass. To be honest with you, I mean, would they do it today? No, no. Yeah, no. But for the time, I get what I said is that it could have been a hell of a lot worse. <laughs> like they yeah, really well back then, have... you know, it made sense. It's yeah. it's like yeah, okay, Bond's going undercover in Japan. He's 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 a Scotsman, and they have to make him look Japanese. You know, nowadays it'd be like, "How dare you put on right. Japanese face? How dare you?" But the '60s, I expected like you know, extreme you know, slanted eyes and the whole nine yards. No, they did a Mickey I, I Rooney say, and Breakfast at Tiffany's. Exactly. Thank you. And I wouldn't say they did they they did a good job making him look remotely Japanese, but they didn't go to that extreme. And they did right. a good job of like having him like keep his head down. They made it believable. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and, just trying to get this guy to pass through, and you know, because he's obviously he sticks out like a sore thumb, like you said, Rob. That's part of the that's a whole yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's hard part of the whole thing. Yeah, and the um, and what and what's her name? Uh, I can't look up the she, when the when he first they first show him when he's in his disguise, she laughs at how bad it looks, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they acknowledge, they yeah, acknowledge yeah, they that. acknowledge the goofiness of it, yeah. And here's the lost that. super chat, and I apologize for that, Aries. Go ahead, Rob, and finish your thoughts. I, I still love. I still bring up the the line when he's when the girls are bathing him, and and Tiger talks about the men in Japan have smooth skin on their chest. He goes, ja the Japanese proverb says, "Bird does not nest in bare tree," <laughs> <laughs> which yeah, you gotta love. Aries said, and I apologize again for this. Movie themes were basically introduced by Wagner. They are rarely used in Western cinema, Star Wars, the exception, but they are big in Japan. Yeah, I, I noticed uh, as I'm going through a lot of classic films um, that the scores were almost non-existent for a lot of earlier films, which is funny considering before sound was part of the film, that was all music. Um, yeah. But yeah. They hadn't quite perfected the art of, or it was used sparingly. Exactly, yeah. Because I, I even have like one of my earliest soundtracks, I think, is Bride of Frankenstein. And I think that was one of the earlier films to get an actual film score that was original and not just <laughs> reused uh, classical music and shit, yeah. I guess. So, yeah. But yeah, so this has been fun talking about Bond, and I can't wait to see more. Uh, it's getting more Bondish <laughs> phrasing, I guess. But. <laughs> uh it, i like it uh so far and i'm glad i'm, I'm taking this uh journey with uh, you guys so yeah rob you have anything else to say before we go uh no <laughs> i <laughs> i well, i think i think we've said it all really i think so well do check out the burnett work i think you're going to be streaming here in a little bit probably yeah at 2 30 
Yeah, uh, and then uh, we'll have Midnight's Edge After Dark a little later as well. So hopefully we'll see you there. Anything else you want to plug real quick? No, just uh, our our animated series. If you haven't watched it, Dota Dragon's yeah. Blood on uh, Netflix. You uh, want to tell uh, everybody the good news? Uh, yes, it was renewed for season two, actually book two, which is great because uh, that's more work. Bobby got to eat here, so it's always <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice to nice to uh, nice to have some more work uh, uh, industry work. Funny. So oh, congratulations! Uh, good, so yeah, good for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. But no, I, I I'm really proud of the show, and a good friend of mine, Ashley Edward Miller, uh, created the series, and we've known each other. We worked together awesome. for a long time, and and it's great to have. It was really fun to work on that show because I got to see I. I I'd only ever worked in television directing episodes of Femme Fatales, which is basically a Skinamax series. But I, I did I got to see how a, a television series, a, a really well written and well conceived television series, was created from the ground up. So I I learned a great deal working on the show, and I think it shows. I mean, as far as if you like anime and you, I, I think it's a real you like fantasy adventure. I think it's a very sophisticated show. It might surprise you. Even if you don't know anything about the Dota, Dota Two as a game, right. I think the show really stands alone. And I can say that from what I've seen of the coming book two, it's pretty cool. Like I'm awesome. very surprised. It just the story gets bigger and bigger in scope, and it's it's pretty neat. Can't wait. Um, I can't wait to check out the the, the first season yet. Uh, yeah, 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 I think you'll binge it. I mean, they're only like 22 minute episodes, so. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then K Dash asks, and we already uh, covered this, but uh, just one last time before we go, the next movies we're watching are On Her Ma- uh, Majesty's Secret Service and Diamonds Are Forever. Hopefully, that's the plan. So, join us next week for that. Yeah. And until, go ahead, Rob. The Mad On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the the movie that made me want to try to to take up skiing. <laughs> oh, I uh, you know I, I, that I I grew up in Seattle, so we skied. If you could at our our school would bus us up to ski. That was exactly why <laughs> I wanted to ski because of James Bond movies and yeah. Honor Majesty's Secret Service. The first, and you know what? I I mean, even in Spectre, they went into a snowy locale, and I'm waiting. No skiing, no skiing in Spectre. It's it's like a, yeah, it's like wasted opportunities with these movies. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess it's because uh, you know we had snowboarding in You Only Live to or, uh, on, uh, uh, View to a Kill, and the last time they went skiing was in World Is Not Enough, but it was kind of lame. You know, they're 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 they're, they're skiing against paramotor motors, and how fast oh, could wow. you go? Mm. But but now you think about it, like getting Bond on skis in a situation where he's being chased by dudes and with guns. I mean, that's a tough one now. Like, where are you going to go? Why are you up on the mountain <laughs> if you're going to get looking, chased by? Looking for a crashed plane. Yeah, that's, that could yeah. be it. That could. I mean, there is nothing better than Bond ski sequences. They're 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 part of the reason I live. And Honor Majesty's Secret Service has some great stuff in there. We haven't gotten any really over the top sort of reality pushing bursting moments out of th- this current Bond series, have we? I mean, no. I I want to see him ski off a cliff in the big Union Jack parachute. I want to see the you know the the micro jet flying through a hangar and pulling up to the gas station. Fill it oh, up. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's I want to see one of those moments. I, I, mean, I think you you nailed it, man, Rob. The problem that I have with the modern, the especially the Daniel Craig era, is it's so relentlessly realistic. I mean, Casino Royale, the opening, the 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 um running the the um parkour sequence through the construction site and bond on the crane that was the closest we came to like complete unreality but it's great uh, even though it is kind of real but it's great and i there is no more it, it's all spy thriller we live in the jason post jason born world and i'm like come on man and and, and and daniel craig never got a mission movie he never just got, okay, you're going on a mission. We're going to give you a fresh mission. He went from being a, a newly bit minted double O to being old. You know, after Casino Royale, it's like, oh, now I've gone to the end of my career. We never saw James Bond in the middle of his career with Daniel Craig. He just went from from to from Quantum to Skyfall where he's missed a step. You know, he's like old now. Come on, dude. I want you to fight a megalomaniac that wanted to destroy the world. But now it's all no. Got to keep it grounded. Yeah, well, that's sadly, you know. And I keep saying it's not Blofeld, Hugo Drax, or Goldfinger. You know, Max Zorn, 
they're not the greatest they're not the greatest enemies that bond has it's austin powers ever since austin powers yep they've been afraid directors have been afraid to go down that road of the classic bond tropes mm -hmm. because they're, they are so worried it's going to look stupid i'm like no that's what people want to see yeah that's what and you i can, want to see Jeez. i mean i'll tell you something it's it's not exactly analogous but the first kingsman movie when sam jackson was going to you know kill half the planet I mean, that movie was done tongue-in-cheek, but I'm like, you know what? There's something to be said for that first Kingsman movie. There's a lot of good stuff in it. It's too over the top for Bond. It's somewhere That movie's somewhere between Bond and Austin Powers, but it's still got some really great stuff in it. And I want more of that. I want to see Bond have a little bit more of a fantasy bent because I want James Bond to be having a good time. Daniel Craig, he only seemed like he was having a good time as Bond in Casino Royale. You know, when he tells Eva Green, you're perfect ass. And he's like, you noticed. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, and, good. and Bond doesn't care. I'm going to go sleep with some dude's wife. I'm going to take his Aston Martin. I, I, screw you. I'm, I'm, uh, and, and that was great. And then he became like Mr. Dower. The world is, it's terrible. And I'm depressed. And even though I'm James Bond, and I, I you know, that's the whole problem with Kate Craig's run. It was a, it was a subtle moment, but I love the moment in Casino Royale. Where he's at the table and the um, and he says he puts his the guy puts his ass the keys to his ass in the Martin on the table and they said no no we have a please give him a chance to win his money back yeah. knowing that he has him beat <laughs> right uh, I mh mean that's a great that's a that's a bond moment right there I'm like dude get enough of that Casino Royale is the last time that the James Bond franchise was firing on all cylinders and I know people there's all these people that love Skyfall I can't go there. Uh, it's a movie, movie where Bond fails from the opening sequence all the way through to the end of the movie, and and it, it just he I I just don't get it. It's it's the same. It's basically the same plot as the Dark Knight. Really, yeah. Sounds and like that, the that, beginning that, of uh, the problem in Hollywood. And well, the, the, the other big problem is they always want to make it personal. Oh, this it's personal. It's personal. It's personal. I'm like, no, there's a guy with a nuclear weapon pointing. At you know where else? Head. You know what other movie it was personal in? Jaws the Revenge. Yeah. Yeah, because the shark was upset. Yeah. <laughs> it was this voodoo. Time it's personal. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a little trivia for you. The the author of the novelization found the script so batshit fucking crazy that they added a subplot where the shark was affected by voodoo magic just to explain why the shark would do this stupid shit. <laughs> or, or how would it know? Exactly. Like, yeah. You're the Brody's, you're Mrs. Brody. I'm coming after you. Yeah, it's like that's what the, the the author is like. Okay, this is making no sense. So they added this whole entire subplot about revenge against the Brody family, brought on by uh, some voodoo doctor. That's the whole like just to explain why the, the shit's <laughs> happening. That's one of those. I don't know if you knew that, Robert, or not, but that's one of those. I did not. Where, yeah, this where the novelization makes like it takes a few uh, <laughs> liberties with the story because they're like this shit's <laughs> fucking nuts. Thank Think about oh, yeah. it. The two franchises we love the most, Bond and Star Trek, both are afraid of being what they are, what they've always been. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, I don't, Star Trek, I don't understand at all. Uh, it's because the writing staff doesn't understand. Exactly. It I mean, well, with, with Bond, I can understand the problematic aspects. With Star Trek, it's like you're making more problematic aspects than there ever was before. Like right. if anything, Star Trek fits right in with a lot of the type of shit you're trying to do now. And you don't even have to grandstand on it. That's the thing, you know. And that's what a lot of the classic Trek cast was saying last when we were at the last uh, uh, Trek Con thing. Was uh, you know, look, we already had done all this stuff before. We already did that, right? Because you know, right. the new cast members were all trying. Well, we had this gay character, and we had done this, and we had done that. And it's like, uh, been there, done that, kids. It's like that's what they kept saying over and over again. But Action Com on that note says, blame Dark uh, Nolan's Dark Knight, where Hollywood thought everything needs to be gritty and realistic. I'm sure that was a big part of it. Um did the well, board films come out before or after that? They well before. no, it's 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 yeah, it's both. I mean it was as much as I like the Bourne films and I think the third Bourne movie uh from a from a directorial standpoint was kind of a masterpiece because it was something new. The fast cutting was shot to be that way. So Greengrass had enough coverage that he could make those fast cuts and you never it's never incomprehensible. You know where you are. And it was truly what I loved about that third born film 
is it was truly a new form of action filmmaking that was a, a natural evolution of what was happening. But Greengrass, if you look at the cutting in that film, it's it's masterful. And then they tried to turn Quantum of Solace into that with all that quick cutting, but they didn't shoot it. There's not enough coverage to do that with. And, and one of the things I find so annoying about, and I'm a Quantum of Solace apologist. I think there's a lot in Quantum of Solace that's that's worthy of of song but it, it the way they cut it they ruin they ruin so much of what was there and it's it's almost incomprehensible sometimes um but i that's the problem with the bond franchise is it's always best when it's um trailblazing as opposed to catching up and i think so much of the bond franchise in the 70s live and let die you're you're you, it's a black exploitation movie man with a golden gun is a martial arts film and then by the time you get to Spy Who Loved Me, they just decided to abandon all that and go epic fantasy, which was fine. But then then after Star Wars, they're like, oh, because Spy Who Loved Me actually came out in the same summer that Star Wars did after Star Wars had come out. So one of the things that I think benefited Spy Who Loved Me in terms of the box office was the fact that after seeing Star Wars, Bond had, which didn't do so well at the box office with Man with a Golden Gun, benefited from the fact that, oh my God, the Bond franchise is giving us an epic sci-fi movie in Spy Who Loved Me, which is coming on the heels of Star Wars, and it, it became another huge widescreen epic that also relied heavily on special effects that were really well done. So I don't know where I was going with all this. But there you go. That was beautiful. <laughs> um, but I do want to thank everybody for listening in today. And as always, I want to thank Robert for being here. I know you don't have a lot of time, and when you do get time with us, it's always... Always I love it, man. Have you here. I love when you have me here. Thank you, thank you so much. Especially when we get to talk about good things. You know, that's the, the, the crappy part. Is generally when we talk, it's always this bad thing's happening. This franchise is going to hell. That thing's going to hell. You know, at least I love to get together and talk about things that we love, and that's kind of yeah. the whole point of the series. So, yeah, and you know, it's what's funny. Even though this is one series of films, that even though there's a lot of of films in this series that I don't think are particularly good, I love them all. Right. Like I can't. I wish I felt the same way about modern Star Trek as I do about the Bond franchise, because like even on a like I don't like a View to a Kill at all, but I'll watch it and I'll enjoy it, even though I know it's not good. Star Trek just makes me angry, whereas the Bond franchise as a whole, I just enjoy it, and and even though I objectively know that that these films are not. There's, I would say half the movies are, I think are great and half are not so great, but there's something about this franchise that's always been endearing to me ever since it began in 1962. Well, there's always the promise that the, that the next one will be better because we've seen like, there's been bad Bond movies. Uh, okay. Yes. You know what? Maybe all right, Moonraker wasn't good for your eyes only is, is, uh, is better. You know, yes. uh, you know, the tomorrow, tomorrow never dies. Isn't very good. The world is not enough is, is better. You know, yes. the, the, there's always room for the, the series to bounce back. You and know. you know what? Tomorrow Never Dies has aged very well. Yeah. You go back and you watch it. I mean, I loved GoldenEye, even though even that's not perfect. I'd give it three out of four stars, but it's got a lot to love in it. And um, Tomorrow Never Dies uh, has so much cool stuff in it, and it's just fun to watch. And uh, again, I think they just... They they cut a, they cut too much out. Like I read the, the novelization of Tomorrow Never Dies, and the end. I think the only problem with that is that the villains are a little too cartoonish. The only good news is bad news. <laughs> you know, like come on, man. And Stamper, the villain, had his pleasure and pain centers reversed, and then they reuse that in the world is not enough because they they cut all that stuff out of the film. So it's. It has the climax is really abrupt and it's a little silly, but there's a lot of stuff to like in Tomorrow Never Dies. I I, I like that movie more and more as the years go by. Yeah, I mean it, it has it does has its moment and it's 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 pretty it's pretty uh, relevant now because of all the the media yeah. we consume and everything and how that Maybe drives news narratives and stuff. Yeah, I think that's probably why it's become more resonant and 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 what's going on right now with China and the South China Sea and all that. They, I mean, they predicted all that shit. So, and that was in the late nineties. And, and oh, Michelle Yeoh is fantastic in it too. She's so good. And you know, I miss I, I that was a uh, the last time that uh, oh no, he did World Is Not Enough too. But David Arnold did a great 
big brassy symphonic uh score and i man i i miss that i miss david arnold was sort of always he loved the bond movies he was emulating john barry's scores and he that was the first time david arnold scored the franchise and it's so good his score for that movie is so good awesome yeah. we, need right, more, boys. we need more let's wrap this up because i don't want to drag this too far yeah uh, sorry no, 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 no. I just don't want to like make it too late. And I know you got a show coming up here, Robert, and we do as well later. And uh, we got another super sticker here from Alpha Dean Lewis. Thank you so very much for that. We appreciate it. I just want to double check, make sure I didn't miss any other super chats. And I just want to thank everybody again, and especially Robert for being here. Check out the Bird Network. Robert has his own channel as well, Robot Shlomo. Uh, Rob, that is our Rob. Uh, yeah. So check that out as well. And check out Midnight's Edge After Dark. That's what we'll be streaming later on tonight. Um, that'll probably be roughly after uh, Rob's done sh streaming over on his channel about that time. So uh, thank you so much for being here, guys. And until next time, take care of yourselves and each other.